Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and that means, of course, it is time for our midweek Bible study. Um, I have to kind of tell you right off the cuff, I don't know how much energy I'm going to have tonight. I'm really going to need the Lord to help me. Um, these days, I can't do a whole lot of physical activity without it exhausting me, not just making me a little tired. It literally just knocks me right off my feet. And uh, at the church space where I've been working on our Club Connect project, we normally have a raised, there's a raised parking lot. You go up a little bit of a ramp and there's a raised parking area in the back. And then there's a ramp that comes across from that area to the second floor of our building and our space is on the second floor. So normally I'm able to drive in the back and I have a little mobility scooter that I use because every step that I don't have to make um, helps me immensely. Uh, so when I go into stores and stuff, I use those little mobility scooters. And when I'm uh, at the church and everything, you know, I use my little mobility scooter. And that saves me walking from my truck all the way around because our space is kind of located, you know, it's a pretty good walk. And uh, it saves me a lot, a lot of steps. And... Um, Anyway, so unfortunately, I don't know how long this mess is going to be, but that means that right now I don't have the ability to use my mobility scooter. I have to climb quite a few steps to get up to the second level. And um, you can't appreciate how much energy it takes to do stuff like this until you don't have the energy to do it. And um, it is exhausting for me. And today I had to go up and down those stairs about, I think it was four different times. And um, if I'm carrying stuff, you know, that makes it even worse. But uh, I went down to my truck at one point. I had to go to Home Depot. And I went down to my truck. And uh, I realized I'd forgotten my phone up in the church space. And I just have to say, well, forget it. You know, I literally, I, you know, um, I cannot make that extra trip up and down those stairs. Um, literally, this is how these days I have to um, budget every single step I take. Um, everything I do, I have to be very mindful of how much energy I'm putting out, how much effort I'm exerting, and um, it is exhausting. The last couple of Wednesdays, y'all may not have realized that if you look at the videos, I've looked at the videos after Wednesday night Bible study, and I see myself kind of hopping into the seat and starting the live broadcast. And I kind of started out, if you notice the last couple of weeks, I kind of started out like, you know, because literally by the time I am ready to start Bible study, I've just been at a dead run, literally, all day. And by the time Wednesday night Bible study comes along and I sit in the chair, I kind of take a breath because this is the first time I've sat down in hours and hours and hours. And um, so anyway, I say all that to say, Keep me in prayer tonight. I know that the anointing makes the difference. I know that 
The promise of God's word is they that wait upon the Lord. That does not mean they that sit in front of Jesus sitting there. Yes, Lord, what do you want me to do, Lord? That's not what that term means in that context. In that context, that passage literally means they who do the Lord's bidding. It's the same way you say that someone waits tables or they wait on tables. They're doing the bidding of those that are seated at those tables. They're serving the one who sits at those tables. And when the word of God said, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Literally, if you think about it, everything he's saying, why in the universe would it say that if you're just sitting there waiting on Jesus, you're going to sprout wings and fly and you're going to be able to walk and not be, you know, what does that mean? You know, no, it means that those who were doing the Lord's bidding, those who serve the Lord and do what God has called them to do. He has promised that he would renew their strength, that he would allow them almost supernaturally to be able to perform their duties uh, in spite of circumstances like uh, I'm in today. So just keep me in prayer because I really seriously need the Lord's help today. I am wiped out beyond measure and uh, we've got club connect pretty much set up i finally have the coffee bar the bar assembled and in place so now it's just a matter of finishing out that one area at the back the coffee bar area because i moved it we were going to have it in one part of the space but i decided to rearrange the entire space last week. So now it's at the back of the room and uh, I've got to put up shelves. I got to do a whole bunch of stuff. But that, you know, is pretty much the last thing we need to do. And then God willing, uh, by the help and grace of God, next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, we will open Club Connect for the first time. And we'll be open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It is members only. Uh, you have to join the club, so to speak, to be able to have access to this uh, facility. And um, I'm not going to do a big commercial for that. But you can look it up online at Club Connect uh, hyphen AL for Alabama, obviously, dot com. And it'll tell you all about it, and you can find out there how you can join. We have a uh, initial offering membership for the first year of $25, and I hope that Alabama folks will go and join. Um, if we get a good uh, amount of support and we have people come out and uh, take advantage of what we're doing. My goal is to move the club within the next, it could be as little as four months or five months, uh, but within the next whatever time it takes, we'd like to move it to a much, much bigger space, about four times the size of what we have now. And if and when we do that, all of the amenities will be expanded and improved, and it'll be a terrific place. We'll have a much bigger uh, lounge area, much bigger game room, including pool tables and, you know, maybe even ping pong and uh, some other things, um, ski ball and air hockey. I've looked at all kinds of stuff. Uh, but I wanted to start it off small. We've got the church space, so we might as well use it. We only use it one day a week, so we might as well use it uh, for this. 
and uh, we wanted to start out small and then keep our investment you know tight and uh, see how people respond to it and if we get a good response then we'll really do it up big and it's beautiful now folks I've worked real hard to make it very nice um, but if we go big it's gonna be every bit as beautiful if not better than what we have now but I just need to know that the community is gonna come out and support it before I can invest uh, the kind of resources that are going to be necessary for a much bigger space. Okay, we want to go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our Bible study tonight. I ask you to bow your heads with me and let's pray. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank you for the word of God, the word of truth. We thank you for the anointing and the touch of the Holy Ghost that allows us to read your word, but to be guided as we read by your spirit and your presence so that we might not walk aimlessly through the pages of this glorious sacred text but we might be led of the Holy Ghost, led in such a manner as to rightly divide the word of truth. For Lord, you have declared that your word is given to man line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Master, in the name of Jesus, I am so tired tonight, and I really need the anointing and the touch of the Holy Ghost. I want to do the Word of God justice. I want to uh, deliver to the people of God information that will help them and serve them, educate, uplift, inspire and liberate master in the name of jesus touch tonight the teacher touch the student every individual that hears and watches by reason of the internet let our hearts our minds be open that we not merely hear that which is spoken, but that we be of a mind and a heart to receive tonight from the word of the Lord. We ask it all in none other than Jesus, 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 wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We've been talking about the last 12 or so weeks We've really been laying the groundwork, trying to talk about the reality of the spirit realm. Do we as Bible-believing Christians believe that there is a spirit realm? Absolutely. What exists on the spirit level? Well, uh, God exists obviously on the spirit level. Angels exist on the spirit level, and demons exist. That's kind of a, uh, a real simple way of breaking it down. But the devil and demons exist as well on the spirit level. God is served by angels whom he has created to assist him in ministering to and for the people of God. And then, of course, the enemy, Satan, was created in order to provide an alternative. Because if God was going to have a people who chose to love him and chose to serve him, it was necessary that there be an alternative. Uh, you, you know, you can't, you, you can't say you've given somebody a choice if you say to them, okay, pick. You can either have A or 
nothing. No, there has to be a bee. And uh, so even as God created light and darkness, the Word of God declares He created both good and evil. And so uh, we fully understand there is a spirit realm. We also understand that human beings were designed by God to be spiritual beings. We occupy a body. After death, our spirit, our uh, spirit departs from the body, and when the spirit departs from the body, some people believe that that spirit, often referred to as a ghost, same way we talk about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost. Uh, spirit and ghost are synonymous. A lot of people think that uh, spirits are able to make choices after death as to whether or not they want to ascend, as it were, to, you know, uh, depending on your belief system, some people say to a higher place or to the next, you know, the next level, uh, the next plane, as it were. Um, and some people believe that uh, the spirit often depending on circumstances surrounding their death, that the spirit kind of gets trapped here, gets stuck here in the earthly plane. And uh, so as biblical Bible-believing Christians, do we believe that spiritual entities uh, can interact in the natural world. Absolutely, we believe spiritual beings can interact with the natural world. When you read the Word of God, you find out that this clearly took place um, during the days of Noah prior to the flood. Part of what led God to uh, basically erase, as it were, the face of the earth and kind of start over was the fact that uh, spiritual beings had interacted in the natural world to the level that they literally were uh, having children with uh, human women. And uh, there are stories that have been told going back to antiquity of giants. And that does not mean people who are 400, pe 400 feet tall. But no, but giants, people who were extremely tall, much, much larger than the average human being. Some of them going as high as uh, eight or nine feet tall, okay? And uh, there have been stories told of people and races of people uh, who had these very unusual and unique attributes, whether it be height or strength. And uh, according to the Word of God, we are told that many of these uh, types of figures did indeed actually exist. And they were the byproduct of uh, the spiritual infringing upon and interacting with the natural world. So God chose to hit reset, as it were. When he hit, when he hit reset, uh, there were boundaries established and rules established. And so now... Uh, spirits can and do interact in the natural world. However, there are certain rules that must be obeyed. There are certain rules that must be followed. We looked at the primary rule of the spirit realm, and that being that no spirit can involve itself in the life of a person at any level without some form of invitation or some form of a door being open, whether it is open on purpose and the spirit is specifically invited, as is the case with many 
uh, ancient religions and the occult and witchcraft and things of that nature, or whether inadvertently people leave a door open for a spirit, which they then in turn interpret as an invitation. You know, you've left the door open, so hey, all bets are off. Now, tonight we want to begin to look at the issue of ghosts and hauntings. What does the Word of God say concerning the dead? What does the Word of God say concerning the spirit of man after it has departed the body? When the body has yielded up its life, and there is no more life in it. It is buried, it is burned, it is, um, sometimes it is uh, released into the sea. And what then happens to the spiritual aspect of the human being? Now, I've got some scripture for you. I want to start out by reminding you Within the context of the Old Testament Hebraic law, Isaiah 8 and 19, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead. So God is saying through the prophet Isaiah that he does not want his people interacting with anyone. Listen to how it's worded. He said to anyone that have familiar spirits. So right there we are told something very important. We are told that spirits can and will and do attach themselves and interact with individuals who claim to have a sixth sense or a uh, supernatural ability, if you want to call it that, whether that be those who claim to be psychics, those who claim to be mediums, uh, people who refer to spirit guides. Folks, a spirit guide is a familiar spirit. What is a familiar spirit? A familiar spirit is a spirit that has attached itself, listen carefully, and entered into a relationship with an individual. So these psychics and these uh, mediums and what have you who claim that they have spirit guides, they have entered into a relationship with a spirit being. Now, oftentimes they will try to tell you that that spirit that is their guide was an individual who lived many years ago, and oh, my spirit guide used to be this, or my spirit guide used to be that. Uh, my spirit guide was a ship captain back in the 1800s, or my spirit guide, you know, served in Cleopatra's court. We hear stories uh, like this all the time. What does the Word of God say concerning this? We're going to see in a moment. That was kind of a teaser. We're going to see in a moment, but let me again read to you from the Hebraic Law, Leviticus 19.31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. So see again. God is by no means suggesting that these people are not in fact and indeed operating with a spirit being. No, he is plainly and clearly making it abundantly clear 
that yes, these people are in fact dealing with a spirit being. This is why it is so dangerous when people go to um, these people who have these familiar spirits because by going to them and exposing yourself to their familiar spirit, you are opening a door up to yourself for an attachment. Therefore, you may find after going uh, to or bringing in a psychic or a medium, you may find that all of a sudden you're being vexed by something unseen. You're being oppressed by something unseen. You're feeling the uh, effects and the influences of something that is invisible. Well, you open the door to that by simply going and putting yourself in close proximity to someone who is operating under the auspices of uh, a familiar you have exposed yourself and you have inadvertently opened a door. This is what we talked about in previous studies, okay? Now, he said, Regard not them, Leviticus 19.31, that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards. These are individuals who... Uh, supposedly um, interact with the spirit realm through the use of substances. That would be wacky tobacco and things of that nature and LSD and what have you. Any type of mind-altering substance uh, when you allow yourself to have an altered state you make yourself susceptible to spiritual interaction and spiritual influence. So he said, neither seek after wizards, listen, to be defiled by them. So what that tells you is, when you go to these people, you may walk away having been defiled. What does that mean? That means now you've walked away with an altered state. You've walked away differently than when you went to see them. Okay? So you must be very careful. We talked about this in terms of opening doors. How can you open a door? Well, one way was putting yourself in close proximity to these things. We talked about um, messing with articles of divination. Articles of divination can include Ouija boards, you know. Uh, it can include performing seances. It has to do with the occult, trying to cast spells, utilizing... Um, utilizing um, the occult, Ouija boards, tarot cards, anything that is used in order to connect you with the spirit realm. And so uh, we must be very, very careful not to uh, seek out these things, not to involve ourselves with these things, The Lord said, I'm going to finish Leviticus 19.31, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy 18.10 and 11, the Lord gave a law as part of the law, said, There shall not be found among you Anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, 
Christians do not consult uh, horoscopes. If you're one that reads the horoscope to try to get uh, a heads up on how your day or your week or your month or your year is going to go, uh, then folks, you are walking on very thin ice. You're in very dangerous territory because uh, that is not something that children of God do or an observer of times. That would be horoscopes and uh, that sort of thing. Or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter. Listen, with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. Notice how in three passages I've read to you, God has made it abundantly clear that yes, there are such things as familiar spirits. Nowhere in his Speaking of this, does he imply or suggest that the spirits are the dead? No, we understand that the spirit realm consists of uh, two areas. You have God and the angels, you have Lucifer, Satan, and demons. Those are the two realms of the spirit. What about human spirits once they are disembodied? What about human spirits once they are separated from the body? We're going to get into that in just a minute. I keep teasing y'all here. So now listen in First Chronicles chapter 10, 13, and 14 to show you how seriously the Lord takes this prohibition on consulting uh, witches and uh, diviners and what have you. In First Chronicles 10, 13, and 14, the word of the Lord reads, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse. Saul went to a woman who had a familiar spirit. She wound up conjuring up the spirit of Saul's former advisor and mentor, Samuel, about scared her to death. All of a sudden, she knew, she recognized something was up. Why? Because this was not the spirit she normally interacted with. This was not her familiar. This was something different. And immediately, she realized, wait a minute, this is Saul. He, th this, this is... <laughs> This is going to put me in a very dangerous place because the law calls for anyone who practices the um, occult practice of communicating with the dead uh, to be killed. And she knew that she was in deep trouble. But because Paul went, excuse me, Saul went to one who had a familiar spirit he ultimately wound up, the Lord called him home. He said, all right, your life is over. You're done. No longer will I permit you to be king over Israel. And he took 
Saul's life and turn the kingdom over to his successor, King David. Now, in Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27, we learn a little bit about what the state of existence is for the human spirit post-death. Mark 12, 18 through 27, Then come unto him, meaning Jesus, the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed, meaning any offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven had her, and left no seed, no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven." As touching the dead, that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, Moses, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. So here we had a, a sect, S-E-C-T, within the Jewish faith who did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe that there was life after death, as it were. Okay? They did not believe that the spiritual aspect of man uh, existed and would be called forth one day from the grave. Uh, so they came to the Lord. They thought they'd trick him. They thought, you know, they had put a little uh, situation together that was really going to, you know, put Jesus in a tight spot because he was teaching, as the Pharisees teach, that there was, in fact, a resurrection. Isn't it funny how, within the Jewish faith, uh, the teaching of resurrection is absolutely factual within Judaism, and yet still there were uh, those within Judaism who denied the resurrection. You wonder how it is that in the Christian world there can be people who in spite of everything the Word of God teaches concerning the baptism and infilling of the Holy Ghost, they still deny the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, even in the Lord's day, you had those who in spite of clear, distinct teaching concerning the resurrection, they denied that doctrine. They refused to believe that doctrine. So there's nothing new under the sun, folks. As long as human beings have had access 
to the word of God as long as human beings have had access to the sacred script. There have been those who want to flat out deny and repudiate teachings and doctrines which are as clearly expounded and as plainly expounded as anyone can possibly read them but they choose to believe something different. So that's not a new situation in our world today. It existed in the Lord's day as well. And they gave him a situation where a woman was married to a man, her husband died, they had no offspring. So according to the law of Moses, she married the next brother. Uh, he died. There were no offspring. She married the next brother. He died. There were no offspring. By the time it was all done, she had married seven men. Apparently, she was either barren or they were all uh, shooting blanks. I don't know. But one way or the other, there were no offspring. There were no children born in any of these seven relationships. And the Sadducees asked the Lord, you know, if this resurrection that you teach is real, then whose wife will this woman be when she is uh, resurrected and these seven men are resurrected with her? Whose wife is she going to be? <coughs> and the Lord told us plainly and clearly, he said, y'all are acting foolish because in the resurrection, obviously, the nature of the spiritual man is different than the nature of the physical man. And he said, and that includes human relationships. Relationships which we had in this life are dissolved after death. Because we're returning after death as a spiritual being. We are returning to the state in which God initially created us. He did not create you as so-and-so's wife or so-and-so's husband. For that matter, he did not create you so-and-so's son or so-and-so's brother or so-and-so's, you know, father. No, he said in the resurrection, they are neither married nor given in marriage. After the resurrection, there is no marriage. Any marriage that existed on earth was the byproduct, listen, of the human need for companionship and intimacy. Said, that is why when we do marriage ceremonies, we promise and we make a commitment until death do us part. Because at the moment of death, that commitment is over. It's done with. In the resurrection, you will not be married to that person any longer. Some people say, well, but you know, bless God, I just love my husband so much. The Mormons teach, oh, you're married for eternity. If you go through this temple ritual and you seal your marriage for eternity, you're married to that person for eternity. Baloney, Jesus said, you're neither married nor given in marriage. He said, but they are like the angels. So after the resurrection, our spiritual man is asexual. It's not male or female. We are asexual. He said the angels are the same. They often represent in this, when they appear in this life, they often represent as male but the angels do not have male genitalia. They're neither male nor female. So it will be after the resurrection. Now, the word of God does tell us also that after the resurrection, we shall be known even as also we were known. So Paul said, we will retain our identity, 
Therefore, if you were a person's brother or a person's mother or son or husband or wife, then there's the likelihood that you will still be remembered as such and you will still be identified as such. But that relationship was all the byproduct of earthly carnal living. It has absolutely nothing to do with your spiritual man. So therefore, the relationship is dissolved, but you will still be known. You'll still know that person who was your mother. You'll still know that person who was your grandmother or your great-grandmother or your great-aunt or who, whatever the case might be. So we take comfort in that knowledge that we retain the identity whereby we were known in this life, but relationships, especially, particularly the marriage relationship, no longer exists after death. So our spiritual man, it's not just a matter of our spiritual man existing on another plane, but our spiritual man has a very, listen carefully, has a very different type of existence, period. Our spiritual man walks and lives as a child of God. And the only relationship that we acknowledge and the only relationship that we have as a spirit being is that of God's son or God's daughter or simply God's child. Because as I've said, there's neither male nor female. Interestingly enough, we have people who want to tell us that, oh, this house was haunted and I was communicating with this ghost and uh, this spirit was that of a woman. Oh, I see. Okay. So according to you, not according to the word of God, but according to you, after death, the spiritual man, the spiritual person, retains gender identification. According to you, I guess this ghost still has genitalia that is feminine or has genitalia that is masculine, that is not consistent with the teaching of God's word. Now the Lord said plainly, God says plainly again in Matthew 22, 32, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So what does this tell us? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob long had been dead. And the Lord is here saying, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So what does that tell us? That tells us that when the body is dead, the spirit yet lives. So we know, yes, we know that the spiritual man that once occupied that form, that body, that frame as it were, we know that the spiritual man has now graduated out of the body into the spirit realm where it is free of gender identification, no longer has familial ties. And we know that that spirit man is yet living. It's alive. It's conscious. Because God is declared, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. We know prior to the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary and uh, being raised from the dead the third day, we know that the story of Scripture, the testimony of Scripture, is that during the three days the Lord was dead, bodily in the grave, that he 
uh, descended, the word of God tells us, into Sheol. He descended into hell. And the word of the Lord says that he preached unto the spirits that were there. And that place is referred to as a paradise, meaning a garden. It was a room. It was a place of waiting. It was a specified area with borders. These spirits were not able to travel outside of the borders of this place. And this place in Jewish tradition was called Abraham's bosom. When we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus last week, we talked about the fact that the rich man died, the word of God said, and went to hell. Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom. Abraham and Lazarus were able to look across a great void, a great divide, and they were able to see one another. Why? Well, because paradise, Sheol, was part of hell. They were being held in a place that was part of... Now, some people don't like that ideology. They don't like to think that that was the case. But there was no access to heaven for those who had died prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore... Spirits having life beyond death had to be able to go somewhere. But they couldn't go to heaven. But those who were waiting and looking and believing God for Messiah to come, the word of the Lord tells us they went to this place, this I use the room, uh, the term room very loosely, but to this room, as it were, this holding place, which again is described as a garden. People think that hell is just one big massive, you know, lake of fire and brimstone, and that's how preachers preach it, glory to God. Every inch of hell is the same and always has been and always will be. I'm sorry, but that is not what Scripture teaches. That's not what the Bible teaches. God was able to section off a portion of hell and allow it to be a garden, a paradise, where those who were waiting and looking, believing God for Messiah, where they could go and wait. Because after death, the spiritual man has to be able to go somewhere. God did not have these spiritual people who have left their bodies wandering around the earth waiting for Jesus to come. No, there was a destination. There was a place for them. Again, in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man went to hell and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. In either case, both individuals had a destination, and that destination was preset and determined by their faith and their life experience. We know that death is often referred to by the Lord and by the Word of God as a state of sleeping. In Mark chapter 5, verse 39, And when he, meaning Jesus, was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. 
why does scripture use the metaphor uh, for death of sleeping? Well, it's easy, because when you're sleeping, the expectation is that you're one day, at some point, you're going to wake up. And so, therefore, we understand that death of the body is only, in reality, the body sleeping or resting, as it were, because one day that body's going to wake up. It's going to be fully restored. It is going to be resurrected from the dead. We know that according to the word of God, the promise and hope of believers is that the body we have now will be changed. It's not, we're not going to simply slip into something entirely different. No, God is literally going to take what we currently have and transform it into something different. This is probably why, after the resurrection, we will be known, even as also we were known, will retain a certain amount of identifiers, will retain a certain amount of our identity, probably because the body we'll have after the resurrection is going to be modeled after the body we had in this life. However, it will be changed. It will be transformed. Uh, that which is imperfect will be made perfect. That which is sinful will be made sinless. That which is subject to uh, corruption will be made uncorruptible. That which is temporal will be made eternal, and we will have an eternal body. Now, In Psalm chapter 88 and verse 10, the word of the Lord reads, Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Selah. Psalm 115, 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Ecclesiastes 9 and 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead, listen, know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. This refers to possessions. They don't own anything. When you die, you don't have it. You don't own anything anymore. You're no longer the owner of a house. You're no longer the owner of clothing. You're no longer the owner of a wedding ring. You're no longer the owner of anything. Job said, naked I came into the world, and it is certain that naked I'm going to leave it. The dead possess nothing. Okay? All that spiritual man who has left that body, all that spiritual man possessed in reality was the body that he lived in. So again, we have people who want to tell us, oh, you know, this lady in white, this woman in a wedding dress, her heart was so broken when her husband didn't come home and, you know, she's spending eternity roaming around in a wedding dress. So what we're supposed to believe in contradiction to the word of God is that after death, you're in possession of a wardrobe. You still own clothes. You still have clothes. You still have uh, possessions. We're supposed to believe, well, this person lived in this house, and they really love this house, and it's as much their house as it is mine. That is not what the Word of God teaches. In as much as the marriage contract is fulfilled and evaporates at death, so too does our reward or 
our ownership, our possession of anything and everything. When Howard Hughes died, it doesn't matter how much money he had in the bank, how many properties he owned, how much artwork he had, all of those things no longer belonged to Howard Hughes. So the notion that the dead stay with property that they owned because they still feel they own it or they still feel a connection to it is in contradiction to the word of God. The notion that the spirit of the dead attaches itself to some object or some item that, oh, in life, they this woman just loved this jewelry box. Folks, I mean, come on, I wish people would just use their heads for half a second. How bloody stupid is it to think that you're going to spend eternity attached to some stupid trinket box. I don't care how much you loved it in life. It is absurd to think. You know, it, it, I, I'm always amazed when I watch these paranormal programs. I'm always amazed at how easily these people buy into all of these scenarios that are presented to them by these unseen spirits, information that is fed to them uh, audibly or through whatever means of divination they might be using, and they just buy right into it, you know, they buy right into it. Oh, this guy loved his job so much that when he died, he still comes to work. And he still, you know, does his job. He was a, a night watchman, and he loved his job. Listen, you don't know enough about that person. You don't know squat about that person. Are you going to tell me that of everything in their life, be it people, family members, spouses, homes they owned, all these things you claim that people become eternally attached to. You're going to tell me that of all the things these people had in their life, that the one thing that stood out above and beyond everything else was going to work every day and walking through a factory and turning the key in their little clock that hangs around their neck to show that they'd been to different points in the factory. I've worked as a security guard in a, a metal a mill, a metal factory years ago. <laughs> and that's what we used to have to do. We had a little clock device that hung around our neck. And as you would go at night around the factory, there were certain spots you'd stop at. And there was a key. You'd put it in and you'd turn it. And it would make a mark. And that would help later to show that you had, in fact, done your rounds. It would show that you were at this specific spot at this specific time. Of course, nowadays they have much more uh, advanced technology than that. But back in the day, that's what we had. We used to have to do. But this is the level of naivete that people uh, are in when they sit there and they believe that this unseen spiritual entity is in fact this dead person because after all this dead person used to work here this dead person used to drive a train well amy's husband clint drives trains he's an engineer for trains something tells me as much as uh 
Clint enjoys striving trains that if he were to pass, God forbid, uh, today, I'll bet you a dime to a donut, he'd probably, if he had a choice, he'd rather be home with his family watching the kids grow up and looking over Amy than he would be driving the train. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? And to suggest that we know so much about these people that uh, we understand, you know, oh, this person just loved this job, or this person just loved this item so much, or this person just loved this house so much. Got news for you. If, if I were to die tomorrow, uh, and I had a choice, and I were able to choose what I was going to haunt, if, if I was going to pick a house I wanted to live in, wouldn't be the house I'm in now. Not at all. There's a house that my parents had when I was a kid that I grew up in that I loved. I loved living in that house. To me, it, at the time anyway, it was like a, a, a blown up version of a dollhouse. And I used to love that old house. I'm going to tell you a little secret. As much as I love that old house, I highly doubt that I'd want to spend eternity roaming around that house with a bunch of strangers living in it and it going into disrepair because the last time I went by it, the poor place was just in awful condition. The current owners are not taking any kind of care of it. You know, I mean, things change. Circumstances change. Life changes. So when these spirits present themselves, and this is one of the things that we want to talk about, they always use a number of means to try to establish their legitimacy. One of the means they will use to try to establish their identity and establish their legitimacy is the history of the property. So if some old lady lived in this house and she died in this house, a spirit is easily able now to present itself as this old lady. Because it's not a far stretch. It's not hard for people to believe that this unseen spirit that they have no way of vetting. They have no way in the universe of absolutely unequivocally identifying this unseen entity as whatever it may present itself as being. So, do we believe that there are spirits that interact in the natural? Absolutely we do. What are those spirits called? Well, they're either angels or they're either demons. But what is the work of a demon? Well, demons' primary objective is to bring into question the Word of God, to make people doubt the Word of God. So if I can make you believe that after death you can get stuck somewhere, or after death you can choose to stay somewhere that you really, really loved, if I can make you believe these things, then what the Word of God says happens after death is mute means nothing. It's moot. That has no significance whatsoever. Because after all, the ghost of Mary Jane Smythe told me that, you know, she loved this house so much that after death, she decided to stay in it. 
So therefore, I don't have to fear God. I don't have to be concerned with the eternal judgment. I don't have to be concerned with the notion of heaven or hell. I don't have to be concerned with how I live my life or how I do things or whether I believe the gospel or whether I reject the gospel. Because after all, I have a firsthand account from Mary so-and-so that after death, you know, this is what happens. Now we go back to the beginning of our study. For the Christian, for the believer, what is the most important aspect of our walk with God? The Word of the Lord. What is our foundation? What is our absolute fallback? The Word of God. If the Word of God says it, we are to believe it. You'll notice when I read to you a few moments ago concerning God's judgment on Saul that First Chronicles 10, 13 and 14, I'll read it to you again. So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord. Even, listen, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So what was Saul's transgression? He acted against the word of God. The enemy wants to cause us to question and to doubt and to discount and disregard the word of God. What better means has he than to present himself as a dearly departed, some soul, some spirit that has left its body, it's, it's died and left its body, but now it's lingering around earth and roaming around. And, uh, you know, we hear all kinds of theories from the paranormal world. Oh, it's partly, uh, sometimes it's because of the trauma and the uh, suddenness of the death, you know, if the death is sudden or if the death is traumatic, if there's a lot of emotion involved, then the spirit can kind of find itself stuck. Where do you get that? What is your authority? Where is that notion set forth? from any authority whatsoever. Is that taught in the Word of God? Is that... A, who, who, no. You listen to these paranormal experts, and half the time they're saying, well, some people believe thus and so. Some people believe this and that. Some people say this. Some experts, so-called, uh, tell us this, and some so-called experts tell us that. So they're literally just pulling out of the dark. They're pulling out of the sky theories and notions that are coming to us without any backing, without any authority. There is nothing, nothing authoritative about what they're saying and yet there are millions of non-believing people who watch these programs every day and they buy into all of these theories. They buy into all of these uh, ideas and ideologies, all of these teachings and theories, and there is absolutely no authoritative basis for these things. As a child of God, we have an authoritative base upon which we stand. There is a foundation. 
upon which we stand. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. In the Garden of Eden, was it not Lucifer who tried to convince Eve to do what? To doubt what God had said. And this is the work of the demonic spirit realm. The word of the Lord tells us in Ecclesiastes 12 and 7, Then shall the dust re return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So according to Ecclesiastes, after death, the body returns to dust, but the spirit is God's possession. It's God's to do with what he wills. This is why the rich man was in hell and Lazarus was in uh, Abraham's bosom. Because God had made the determination. The spirit belongs to him. Therefore, he is able to do with it whatever he desires and whatever he wills. Now, we have these paranormal television shows. We have these so-called paranormal experts who try to present us with all kinds of scenarios which suggests, in essence, that after death, God has nothing in the universe to do with your spirit. God has no involvement at all. Why, God's nowhere to be found. There may not even be a God. Oh, it might be that there's a spirit realm, but God himself may, you know, that may not even be a reality, according to these people. Uh, you know, God is, is a non-issue, as it were. And yet the Word of God says that the Spirit returns to God. It is God's to do with, as he determines, and as he wills. In James chapter 2, verse 26, the word of the Lord said, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So death is the separation of the body from the spirit. We, in the natural realm, identify death as the absence of a heartbeat, the absence of breathing, the, you know, the uh, lack of a pulse, the lack of brain activity, these sorts of things. We're looking at it in the natural, and this is how we determine when one is dead. However, the Word of God teaches when the spirit and the body separate, that is what death truly is. Death comes when the spirit and the body separate. So, if the word of God be true, then we have to conclude line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We have to conclude, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to conclude that at death, the spirit and the body are separated, and at that moment, the spirit is God's. It returns to God. He at that moment, ret he retains ownership over that spirit because he's the one that gave you that spirit to begin with. He was the creator of your spirit to begin with. Now, in John chapter 11, verses 11 through 14, these things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. 
Then saith, excuse me, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So, when the human body dies, there is always, according to the word of God, the expectation that one day that body is going to be revived. One day you're going to awake from slumber. The Bible teaches that both the, uh, the righteous and the wicked will one day be resurrected. Okay, So this is not merely an expectation of the uh, righteous alone, but also the wicked. There will be a resurrection of both the wicked and the righteous. So therefore, every human being that dies, in effect, is physically going to sleep. But their spiritual man continues its consciousness However, the spiritual man belongs to God. God created that spiritual person that you are. And therefore, God determines where that spirit will wait for the resurrection, where that spirit will wait for the moment uh, when he calls for it to awake from its slumber and to rise from the grave. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, this is what I've been talking about concerning uh, Lazarus and the rich man. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, meaning in essence a canyon, said so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Now, they're spiritual beings, but they're not free to go wherever they want to go. They're not free to move about however they want to go. No, they are confined to specific places and specific areas. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, lest they also come into this place. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, 
neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, meaning Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What's he talking about? He's talking about the word of God. He said, They've got the word of God. Let them hear from the word of God. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now he was not talking about if Lazarus went in spirit form and warned them and told them. No, 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 no. said if Lazarus literally rose from the dead, if his body revived and he once again had life and he went to your family members and he told them of this terrible place of torment that he had seen, Abraham said, they're not going to believe him either. How many people in this life hear testimonies? How many people in this life hear people tell of the goodness of God. You know, I talk about all the time the miracle God gave, I mean, a miracle that blew the mind of every doctor. I had doctors come to talk to me from uh, research hospitals, literally, because they said that I uh, defied all science and that what happened to me uh, could not be explained scientifically. Um, I've talked about the miracle God gave me on more than one occasion. And yet, how many people just discard that? They just throw it away. That doesn't mean nothing. You know, he just, he just, oh, it's just circumstance. It's just, it's, these are the same people, mind you, who claim, oh, bless God, they believe science. They, they believe there's a scientific explanation for everything. Hallelujah, glory to God. And yet, when the scientists are standing there, scratching their head and saying, what occurred to you is impossible. We cannot, for the life of us, explain or understand what happened to you. And I share that testament. They still don't want to hear it. So Abraham said to the rich man, he said, they have the word of God. They have the law. They have the prophets. They have the writings of Moses. Let them make their mind up based upon that. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, God does not use the dead to communicate truths to the living. He does not uh, utilize uh, communication with the dead in order to accomplish this end. No, he utilizes his word. Okay, when we die, the Word of God tells us, last verse for today, because it's time for us to end. Perfect spot to, to stop for this week anyway. Hebrews 9.27 And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. <clears throat> Again, Paul says, God has designed this thing to be a one trip around the sun. You know, it's one trip, honey. Past life regression is not as it appears. The notion of reincarnation is not as it appears. It contradicts the word of God. Paul said it's appointed unto man once, once 
wants to die. And then the judgment, meaning simply that like the word of the Lord told us, after death, the spirit returns to God. And it is God's judgment. It is God's determination at that moment after death as to where our spiritual man is going to wait out the resurrection of the dead. And the resurrection of the dead will occur so that every man can be uh, judged according to his works, according to his deeds. Uh, I will tell you, this is not popular. A lot of people in the fundamentalist and evangelical camp are going to get aggravated with me. I don't care. I could care less about I'm not even trying to make these people happy, so I'm not worried about it. They're going to find fault with me anyway. i got enough issues in my life they find fault with. So why should I sit here and worry about trying to make these characters happy? I do not believe hell is the same for every single person. I do not believe uh, heaven, for that matter, will be identical for every single person. No, I, I cannot believe the Word of God and believe either of those two things. The reason I say that is the Word of God says that when the Lord returns and we stand before the great white throne of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, we will be judged by our works. Now, we will not experience eternity in the presence of God based upon works. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you're not going to be saved and wind up eternally in the presence of God uh, simply because you were a terrific person who lived a good life and did a lot of righteous things. No. But will a person who perhaps rejected the gospel or just choose to ignore it and really doesn't even give it any thought and lives their life, but they live a decent life, a moral life, a a righteous life. You see, righteousness is not the possession of the believer. Righteousness simply means to do right. You know, you treat people well. You treat people as you wish to be treated. There are a lot of non-believers. There are a lot of people who are not Christians who live righteous lives. Even in the Jewish community, um, Gentiles who helped to save Jewish lives during the Holocaust are referred to as righteous Gentiles. Does that mean that, you know, they stand on the same footing as a law-keeping Jew? No, doesn't mean that at all. But it means that when they were faced with a life and death, very severe, very difficult decision, they choose to do the right thing. They chose to do the right thing. And they put their own lives on the line in order to preserve and save others' lives. Therefore, they are referred to as righteous Gentiles. So there are a lot of non-Christians, there are a lot of non-believers in the world who live what is in effect a righteous life is hell for them going to be the same as this rich man? No, I don't think so. If God could have a garden that was referred to as paradise in Sheol, that was also known as Abraham's bosom, and that was all part of hell, then why in the world cannot, can God not have a variety of atmospheres and a variety of settings within hell itself that, based on people's lives and the ways in which they conducted themselves and carried themselves, that will determine which existence they're going to experience. They'll be in hell. 
It's kind of like being in a mental hospital or being in a prison. You're locked up. You can't get out. I don't care if there's a ping pong table, a pool table. I don't care if there's a swimming pool and if there's all kinds of amenities. You're still locked up. You still can't get out. Just like Abraham said to the rich man, you cannot freely move about. You can't come here. We can't go there. You're not in a position to choose where you want to be. You'll never be in the presence of God for eternity. You'll never experience uh, eternity with those that you knew in this life. Those that you may have been related to in this life, you know, again, the relationship will not be the same, but you will be known even as also you were known. All the benefits and all the glories of heaven, you will not experience. The word of God said, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them. For those that love him. You won't experience that. And then the word of the Lord tells us in the book of Revelation. That when this thing is all over. That hell itself. Hell itself. Is to be cast into the lake of fire. Which burns with fire and brimstone. So the way I interpret that. The way I understand that is. That the barrier that God creates, as it were, around hell is the lake of fire. So hell is going to become an island, as it were, in the middle of a lake of fire. Doesn't sound like a real wonderful environment. I don't care, you know, I don't care what kind of existence I might have there. It's not going to be a wonderful existence. It is not going to be a pleasant existence. But it is going to be based upon our lives and our conduct and our actions and our deeds. That is the teaching of Scripture. Also, that is divine justice. God is not going to punish a sweet old school teacher who lived her life and loved children and treated people well and did everybody right and did business legitimately and paid everybody what they were due and loved her husband and loved her children and so on and so forth. The same way that Hitler is going to live out eternity. That's insane. It is utterly insane to even suggest that because in suggesting that, we are saying that God is not a just God and God is just. Therefore, as he has said, he is going to judge every man according to his works. So that is going to come into play. But the bottom line is this. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. At death, our spirit returns to God. It once again becomes God's possession. And he is the one who judges and determines where that spirit is going to go. And then after the final judgment, I'm not certain that what people experienced in the temporal between their death and the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked to stand before God in judgment. I'm not certain that they're going to return to the same exact uh, experience that they're coming from. If you understand what I'm saying. In other words, it's kind of like taking somebody out of jail and maybe they were in solitary confinement and, uh, and maybe they were only being fed bread and water. And then you take them to the court and they have their case heard and the judge sentences them. Well, he may not sentence them to go back to solitary confinement and have only bread and water. That may have only been a temporary state for them. 
and then the eternal, what they're going to experience throughout eternity, will be determined by the Lord at the judgment. Anyway, a little controversial, but I don't mind being controversial. Like I said, folks, I made up my mind many years ago uh, that I'm going to believe the Word of God. I don't give a flying fig if the Assemblies of God teaches what I say or if the Church of God or the Southern Baptist Convention or the United Methodist Church doesn't matter to me at all. I believe the Word of God, and the Word of God teaches us that God is just, He is righteous, and that He is going to reward every man, or pay, as it were, every man according to His works. So eternity is not going to be identical for everybody in hell any more than eternity will be identical for everybody in heaven. There's going to be people who live for God. The Word of God said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. There's going to be people in heaven who have a whole lot more reward, whole lot more trophies on their mantle, whole lot more stars in their crown than I'm going to have, and I'm certain of that. Uh, but you'll still be in heaven. You'll still be in the presence of the Lord. You'll still be able to enjoy all the uh, benefits and pleasures of a new heaven and a new earth after God has renovated this mess and recreated it so that all the earth is restored to that same state as uh, the Garden of Eden at the beginning of creation. Anyway, folks, all right, that's all the time we have for tonight. I hope that my being as tired as I am didn't show too much, and I, I hope I was able to do justice to this tonight. I feel like the Lord helped me. I actually feel kind of energized, and I told you the anointing makes the difference. Uh, but we want to close our Bible study tonight with prayer. Once again, if you'll just bow your heads with me. Father, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as the Word of God makes clear it is our privilege as born-again children of the Most High. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of the Lord. We thank you that you have given us a foundation upon which we can stand so that even circumstances and situations which might occur in our world, which are of an invisible supernatural origin, we are able to face these things with a sure footing and a sure knowledge provided to us by the word of the Lord. Master, I pray, God, that those who have heard this tonight, those that will hear it later by reason of recording, I pray, Lord, that each individual will contemplate what they've heard. Lord, that they will put their full and complete confidence in the word of God, because the only thing we have that is guaranteed is the word of the Lord. Master, tonight in the name of Jesus, for those who are struggling with uh, circumstances in their lives of a paranormal or a spiritual nature, I pray, God, that even right now you would begin to make yourself real in their lives, make yourself real in their thinking. Help them to look to you. Help them to look to your word. Lord, that they might anticipate and receive full and complete victory and deliverance in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We thank you, Lord, for this evening. Go with us, O God, from this place and bring us once again to the house of God at the next appointed time, safe and of a sound mind, ready, able, and willing to worship and to receive from your sacred text. We ask it all tonight and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. 
Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I wish if you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, I wish you'd come out and be part of our ministry. We are new here in Huntsville. We're struggling to get some people together to help us do a powerful, wonderful work for the Lord. We meet on Sunday at 3 o'clock at the Century Office Center, 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537. That is in Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. You can check our church out online at www.forward. CLC, all one word, forward, F O R W A R D C L C dot com. Check us out online. See if we're not uh, a ministry that could be a blessing and a help to you in your walk with the Lord. We are a progressive, spirit filled ministry. We are affirming and inclusive of all people. That means whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind, if you have a mind to know God and serve God, you are welcome, and you are fully able to participate at every level in our ministry. We're all human beings. We're all sinners saved by grace. So everyone is welcome and affirmed in our church. I also hope you'll come be with us next Wednesday online. Right now we do our Bible study live online only at 7 o'clock Wednesday. And I hope you'll come be with us next week as we continue our study ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night. we got a whole lot more material to cover. So I hope you'll come be with us. Until we see you again, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.